Good morning. Can we begin our church service with song number 470, There's Sunshine in My Soul Today, and could you all please stand? Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for giving us another day to live and breathe. Father, I want to ask that you would give us your spirit as we enter into worship and praise. May our hearts hunger and thirst after you, and may you fill us, and may we overflow. We thank you so much, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer, we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and welcome to Piedmont Park Church. We're happy that you're here. Um, those who are visiting, welcome, and we hope that you continue to be blessed as we continue our worship in song.
Wasn't that beautiful? Aren't you glad you came to church today? Thank you, Kristen. That was wonderful. Well, good morning. Do you know a church is only as strong as the members? If you look in the bulletin, you'll see we're still in the black. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful for all the people who helped us be a great church. There are many ways you can help. Obviously, offerings is one. It's nominating committee time, so if you have a burden on your heart that there's something you would like to do, there are still openings. And you I think there are still sheets in the foyer where you can fill out what you think you'd like to do. So let's just be thankful and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for the weather. Thank you that spring is starting to come. We're thankful for all the little tiny crocuses that are blooming in bright colors. We're thankful for warmer weather. <clears throat> We're thankful we have this wonderful church that we can come and worship in. Thank you for all the blessings that we have. Amen. I'm up here for a second. As the boys and girls head back to their seats and get their little bulletins, church family, did you notice at the beginning of that story, Mackenzie asked and, and actually told them, she said, I need a volunteer. I need some volunteers. And what happened? Did you see all those hands go up? So, I just want you to know that Mackenzie is now on nominating committee. <laughs> and she's going to be calling you this week. Because she needs volunteers. And she's got amazing spiritual gift power for getting volunteers to say yes. So thank you, Mackenzie. I'll let you go back to your seats. Hey, wow, great children's story. And yes, indeed, we are looking for volunteers here for nominating committee. We are up and running. We've had several yeses so far. And if you are thinking about what you can do for church, I hope so. I hope you're praying about it. If you haven't been, please start because we have many positions to fill and we want you to find your spot in ministry for the Lord. So please be praying about that. If you would like to instruct us and tell us what you're interested in, as Carol mentioned earlier, you can go to the welcome desk. There are ministry opportunity sheets that you can fill out, and you can turn them into one of the pastors or one of the deacons, and they'll get them to us, and that will help guide the nominating committee. But please be praying for us as we continue to work through that. We have a great team. They're doing a wonderful job, but it really comes down to when those phone calls, text messages, or emails come to you, you prayerfully considering how the Lord can use you in our next term. So thank you, everyone, for that. Uh, the next announcement I want to make to you is something new that we're starting here, and this is a ministry that's going to be happening Wednesday nights that Eula Key is going to be leading out in, and it is on memorizing the words of God. I don't know if you've ever been in a small group with Eula or prayer meeting with Eula, and Eula's there, she's way in the back, can you wave Eula, or maybe everybody can see Eula. This lady is amazing when it comes to memorizing scripture. She just blows our minds there, and prayer meeting when someone will say, let's turn to this verse, and sure enough, Eula can recite it without even turning there. And so she's going to help you learn how to memorize scripture. And that's going to be uh, Wednesday nights for several meetings. I think Wednesday night's going to be after prayer meeting, about 740 or so. So come and join us. We would love to have you uh, be a part of that. And now I'd like to have Vanessa come up and do our next announcement. Good morning. I'm wondering, come on up, Laura. I'm wondering how many of you, and raise your hand, know that we have a quarterly newsletter here at the church? Okay, that's what we thought. Not very many. So today, we're excited because we're actually going to pass it out. Up to this point, it's been published on the website and sent out via email, and we'll still continue to do that. But today, the deacons are going to pass out printed copies, and Laura is our editor for that and does a great job. And lots of people contribute articles and uh, poems and that kind of thing, recipes. And uh, so it's really an informative um, little paper and also tells you about events that are coming up in the church. 
and uh, just various things. So, and I know that, Laura, you're always looking for good quality uh, articles and poems and information, so um, that can be sent to, to Laura and she will... Ministry updates, yeah, if you're a leader of a ministry, we love to have little recaps of what you're doing or what might be coming up. And so just keep that in mind. And uh, so enjoy reading that and keep an eye out for it next quarter. And if you want to read past issues, go to the church website and it's under um, the ministry resources tab. And then a walk in the park is the name of the newsletter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa, as our communications chair and to Laura, our head editor for the newsletter. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing that she puts together for us with a lot of people's help. I want to let you know that we do have our fellowship meal happening today, so thank you so much for being here. If you are a guest or a visitor, we would love to have you continue our fellowship with us afterwards. Head down the stairs. Great food is being prepared, and so we'd love to have you stick around for that. And now I'd like to invite Ryan Lindbeck to come up here and talk to us about something exciting that's happening at College View Academy. All right. Good morning, church family. Um, we just wanted to let you know our fourth annual Blue Tie Believers Banquet is coming up. It's a dinner event and an auction that's uh, about fundraising for CVA and inspiration. It's a great opportunity to come together and celebrate the work of the teachers, uh, the work of the students, the achievements of the students, and more importantly, the mission that CVA is carrying out every day in the lives of the students here at CVA. So uh, we wanted to get one of these in everybody's hands. So we are actually going to have students standing in the back. Actually, those students are not aware of it yet, but they are going to be standing in the back handing out these to you as you leave. So please do grab one. Consider attending. It's a great event. If you're not available, it's on April 13th. If you're not available, um, there's a lot of other ways that you can help with auction items um, and other donation opportunities. So um, those of you that have attended know that it's... Uh, it's a great time when we come together, a lot of inspiration, and there's just a ton of goodwill that's done in that room that night. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ryan. Yes, it's a great night. I hope that you will think about coming that night. And now our last announcement is from Mr. Steve Duden, who's going to give us an update on how things are going with our loan that we have for our building. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Um, if you look on the back of your bulletin, we have a little box there called the Leap of Faith box. And you will see last month in February, we were able to make a payment of $7,805 and change on our loan, which is tremendous. Here's my dilemma. Last month, I was out of town, so I was not able to get up and give my little spiel on the third Sabbath. And you gave a great amount. So is that cause and effect? Should I just stop talking to you and you reward me and the church with more money? I'm thinking that may be the way to go here. Um, I do appreciate your uh, constants in giving. Uh, we have, we do have a loan, however, and it's just like any other loan or mortgage, there's interest on it. And so the sooner we get that paid off, the less interest we'll have to pay. Um, it would be nice if that uh, loan were forgiven, but I don't think that's in the cards, folks. I think we're going to have to pay it off. Um, did anybody uh, take up my challenge, my January challenge, where you put $10 on the windowsill at the beginning of the week? Anyone do that? Hey, we got some hands up. That's good. Here's my challenge again. $10, beginning of the week, put it up on the windowsill. You won't miss it. Bring it to church, put it in an envelope, in the building fund line, put $10, and put it in the offering plate. I told you last time, if each of you as a family would do that, in a year we'd raise $93,600. $10 a week, you won't miss it. And uh, I can tell you, I did it. I don't miss it. Um, you just put it up there and ignore it till Sabbath and then bring it on that day. But once again, thank you again, and let's uh, please continue to be faithful in getting this loan paid off so we can get on to other things with our money. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for everyone who's been supporting that effort. We have come a long way, and we are almost to the finish line. At this point, let's continue our worship with some songs of praise, and thank you all for being here today. Happy Sabbath.
Let's start our praise time with uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's If you use your hymnal, it's number 334. Come Thou Fount. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer today, and thank you for everyone who could be here to worship your holy name. Lord, you are the only one that can heal us of, of physical pain and spiritual pain. And please be with Sean Hartz. He help put your hands on her and help her not to feel that pain. And be with other health issues. And if there's anyone out there, in the, right here, who is looking for you, help them. And help them to guide toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Please turn your Bible to John 4, 23. But the hour is coming, and now is when it, the true whispers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking which to worship him. Thank you, Aaron. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. It's a beautiful day outside. I uh, woke up this morning, early in the morning, and spent a little time with God, and I finally uh, took my blinds and I opened them up, and I caught the beginning of the sunrise, and I was like, whoa, blown away. Red, pink, purple, a little bit of orange, and it just blew me away, and it reminded me of one of my students that I used to lead in literature evangelism in Hawaii, and he, he always just had a grateful heart about nature, and whenever he would look up to the sky, he would be like, wow, thanks God for painting that in the sky today. And it just reminded me to be more grateful for even the little things of the sunset and the sunrise, and to give credit where credit is due, that God paints these things within our life, within nature, to remind us of how much he loves us. I will uh, try to be brief today. I was under warning by Vern Thompson that he is watching the clock. And I told him that potluck will be there um, when it's done. So <laughs> let's have a word of prayer because in prayer, there is power. Amen? And more prayer, more power. Father in heaven, I want to ask that you would come into our lives right now, that you would take a detour into our life and reveal yourself to us this moment. I want to ask that, Jesus, you would be lifted up and glorified, for you said that if you would be lifted up, you would draw people to yourself. And that is what this world needs, is a look at the character of Christ and how he loves us. Lord, I just want to ask also that the Holy Spirit would be here, that he would lead us and guide us into truth as is promised. And may we grow closer to you, and may our hearts be nothing more but drawn to you through this message we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever feel spiritually dry? Do you ever feel like you're just going through the motions, whether it's at church or whether you're in your personal devotional time with Jesus? Like you just come to church and you put a smile on your face and act like you're happy, but inside you're dying? Or you say, happy Sabbath, but your happy Sabbath greeting isn't so happy. It's not as genuine as you wished it could be. Or maybe saying hi isn't what you want to do and you just want to keep your mouth shut and just keep on walking past the people greeting you. You just go to Sabbath school, you go throughout your day, you dully sing the hymns, there is sunshine, when there really isn't anything inside. Or fill my cup, Lord. And maybe there's a reality to what you're saying and something true behind that statement, but there isn't a passion behind the words that you're singing. Your prayers seem to just hit the roof of the prayer. <laughs> I just totally messed that up. Your prayers just totally hit the roof of the church. <laughs> but who knows, maybe our prayers just bump into each other and it seems like they don't get past each other. You open your Bible and you're hoping to be given a lesson that's deep. Maybe something that you've seen your pastors or someone you idolize spiritually and you're hoping to get something deep, a deep lesson, and then it doesn't come. And maybe you're here looking for some type of fulfillment, 
hoping that what the preacher says today will quench the dehydrated soul within you. To flood the dry desert you have been wandering in maybe for the last couple days, weeks, months, or maybe even years. For some of us, worship has become a mundane thing. Worshiping God once a week, maybe every other day, or maybe for some it's non-existent. For some, worship even has become disappointing. You've tried so hard to come close to God and your efforts feel futile, and you feel no closer than when you were before, and you feel dry, empty, parched, longing for a drink. And like the woman at the well, known by her location rather than by her name, that woman at the well, we come to the well of the church to dip our buckets in and try to get a drink that would sustain us throughout the week to get us to next Sabbath, living Sabbath to Sabbath, when we should be drawing from our own personal wells, a.k.a. the Word of God, on a daily basis. When Jesus was talking to this woman, for those of you who don't know the story, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but it's found in John chapter 4. They come to a point where Jesus is at the well talking to this woman who has come to fill her bucket, and he's addressed the question, go and get your husband, and she says, I don't have a husband, and he says, you're right, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with is not even your husband. He offered her living water, but before he could give her that water, Jesus had to deal with the stagnant waters of sin within her own life. And she starts to be evasive. Sometimes how we are when someone brings up an issue that may be needing to be dealt with within our own lives, we become evasive and change the topic like this woman did. And she said in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped up on the mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place that is where one ought to worship. Becoming evasive within, with the real problem when it's on you, we tend to point to something else or to someone else because it's easier to talk to maybe about the church than it is about Christ because when we talk about Christ, we come to the reality that Christ wants to change us. And when that change is presented to us, we don't want to change because it means giving something up that may be painful. Not only painful, but maybe uncomfortable. Maybe it's something we love to hold on to. Or just plain easy, um, not easy to give up. And she says... Reading again, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that this in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Today I'm going to be talking about worship, and the first thing that comes to mind when I look at this in the conversation with Jesus, point number one, ignorant worship. The woman is technically, what she's doing here essentially is comparing churches. Our church versus your church. You see, the Samaritans... Their religion was a conglomerate of the teachings of Moses, the law of Moses, and then superstitions and heathen um, doctrines. They were cafeteria Christians. They took what they wanted from where they wanted. They took what they agreed with and what seemed easy to them, and they disregarded the rest. To this woman, as to most Jews and Samaritans, religion consisted in the forms connected with worship, losing the true essence of worship itself. Worship was about the place and the do's and the don'ts rather than he who is to be worshipped. Jesus speaks to how ignorant this type of worship is because it's worshipping God in vain. Cherry picking what we want to believe and thinking that the rest doesn't matter. And I think that we can get caught up in the same way, focusing on the place and the do's and the don'ts of the worship service or how we worship. We make worship about us. What can we get out of the service or what can we do to make the service better to cater to our own liking? We like to find the common ground or the things that are smooth in the Bible that agree with us. 
Or as some religions, they, they like to agree with other religions because they deal away with the things that we don't want to deal with. True and pertinent to what we believe. And see, that's why ecumenism is something that our church tries to stay away from because, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a movement that wants to unite the world Christian churches together. And at first it sounds great. Yes, let's unify, let's get together, and let's worship together. But in reality, what they're doing behind, they are promoting unity, but at the expense of tossing aside truth. Compromise. A great example, which just blows me away, is the Protestants and the Catholics who have come together upon the Reformation, the 500th year celebration of Protestantism, and guess who wants to go celebrate with them? The Pope. And I just find that so contradictory because the whole Reformation was to get away from the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not going to go further into that, but just to bring about the reality is that they want to unite now when in the past they separated for very good reasons because of the teachings that were untrue, unbiblical. And as some people within the world, maybe even some of us, maybe we follow into the category of wanting to worship what suits our perception than what the Bible wants us to follow. Jesus responds to this woman in verse 21. He said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. The next thing that I think of as I'm reading this dialogue between the, Jesus and this woman is another thing that we've done with worship is that we've boxed worship up. Point number two, boxed worship. We have boxed worship up into a four-cornered building that we meet in once a week. As if it's enough, we take our Sabbath punch t time cards and we punch them in and say we're good for the week. That's it. And how many times have we shown up to church and then the next day live as if we never went to church? And I'm not saying that is all of us, but maybe one of us could relate in one time or another in our life where it had become something of that. We box worship up in an hour of the day. We box worship up in a week of prayer. We box worship up in a weekend revival. We box it up and save it for when we need a spiritual high. And ultimately what we are doing is we are boxing up our commitment to God. We box it up into hours, days, weeks, rather than in our hearts and minds. And we wonder why we're dry or empty within our spiritual life. Could it be that we're missing the real point about what worship really is? Boxed worship. Jesus has a solution to it. Jesus in verse 23 goes on and he says, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth and the Father is seeking such to worship him. Jesus' solution is this. He says, the hour is coming and now is the time. You don't have to wait, but now is the time when the place of worship ceases to be a matter of importance the hour is now it's not where but how one worships that counts we don't have to wait until Sabbath and be in church in order to worship God in which most cases some of us may be actually doing that and we're starving ourselves we're drying ourselves out through the week to make it to Sabbath to be spiritually revived or hopefully filled when we should be doing it through the week. The Sabbath should be the climax worshiping experience from the week. Worship throughout the week and then we get to Sabbath and that's the climax of our whole worship experience. 
not to just live Sabbath to Sabbath and go to Sabbath school and go to church and get filled. Hopefully, that's enough to get me through the week. That means, God, I'm going to dwell on this the rest of the week, which there's nothing wrong with that, but we are doing ourselves a disfavor or whatever you call it. We're doing ourselves more spiritual harm than good when we live Sabbath to Sabbath rather than learning to worship God daily. And then when Sabbath comes, it's just an explosion, the climax of our worship experience that we've been worshiping maybe by ourselves throughout the week, and now we come together and worship together. Now, I'm not saying that we should get rid of church. No, I love church. It's a great place to come together and fellowship and to invite other people to be a part of getting to know Jesus. But the church should not be the limit of where we keep worship. Point number three, worship outside the box. Jesus said that the true worshiper shall worship in spirit and truth, meaning your worship should be an attitude of mind and heart rather than ritual forms done in a particular place. The sincerity of worship rather than the motions of worship. Worship should be who you are as a Christian. Most other religions, let's take Buddhism, for example, they want to be just like their God. They even dress like him, look like him, act like him. And then here we are, not all of us, but some of us trying to be like everything but like our God. And then we try to evangelize people. It's like Gandhi said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. But there's some substance to that. We're more apt to worship and be like the people we idolize on TV or what we're listening to, but when it, and we are not afraid to repeat a song that has derogatory terms or foul language in it or a movie that has crude humor. And when it comes to talking about Jesus, we all of a sudden shy away. And we don't want to. It's uncomfortable. Really? Because talking about something derogatory would be uncomfortable. When will we allow our worship experience to go beyond the walls of the church, to flood our lives, to become who we are as a people of God, to be the people God had set out for his people to be? A generation of people that would honor God and how they lived, spoke, and that it wouldn't be a turnoff, but it would be something that drew people in attraction to Christ. The prophet Micah made the distinction between true worship and forms of worship. In Micah 6, verses 7 through 8, Will the Lord be pleased with thousand rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Did you hear that? Did you read it if you were following along? It's not about the empty rituals or the place or the things that we do for God that constitutes worship, but it's the life in which you live in Jesus that is the true worship of God. And this is what Jesus was telling the Samaritan woman. The Father is seeking for such who will worship him in spirit and truth to be the sermon that people need to hear and see within your life because some of them might not even come to church. So we have a responsibility. If we just keep worship within the walls of the church, people may never hear about Jesus. We must allow ourselves to get uncomfortable, to step outside our little bubble because there are blessings outside of our bubble that are far better than the ones that are inside of them.
This comes by having a personal encounter with Jesus, just like the woman at the well. A personal relationship that will give life and meaning to what you sing, to what you pray, and to what you do. Otherwise, you're just doing it in vain. And you'll find yourself dry, empty, wanting more. God in the Old Testament said in Exodus, let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And did you not know that your bodies are the temple of God where God wants to dwell within you so that the light that he is shining shines without it, through you? So it's not about what you do or where you go for worship, but it is Christ in you. The mystery of godliness, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because when we get to heaven in Revelation, it says that we won't be worshiping in a specific place because it will say the tabernacle of God is now with men, which is God, his presence. The whole mode of the sanctuary, the purpose of it, what was in the sanctuary for, was for us to learn how to live and to become like Christ so that we would move closer and closer to the most holy place, which was where the presence of Christ was. And that is where we will be restored into, is back into the presence of Christ. And it will be in the presence of Christ that we worship. It is with Christ being in us that enables us to be able to worship God wherever we want outside the ch church walls. So if you're dry, don't think that it's a bad thing, but maybe try to look at it as a good thing because it forces us to reach out to find a drink. Sometimes we fill it with things we shouldn't. May we try to seek to fill it with the living water, which is Jesus. Our wells are dry, or maybe they're just filled with stagnant waters of sin. Maybe we need to pull the cork and allow them to drain. My mom sent me a picture a couple weeks ago of this pond, and I was going through a very dry period spiritually, to be honest with you. And she sent me this picture of a pond, and I was like, wow, that's really refreshing to see the, to the eyes. And she says, yeah, even a mud petal can reflect the glory of God. But first, the dry parts must be filled with the living water. We can be those mud puddles that reflect the character of God, but first our dry souls must be freshened up with the living water of Christ in us. Fill it with Jesus daily. In conclusion, worship should not be a mindless, ignorant, and boxed-up action that we do, but an expression of who we are in Christ. To allow what Christ is doing within us not to be contained, but to be released outside of the church into the lives of others that we encounter. And our lives can be the worship. It's not just something we do weekly on a Sabbath to Sabbath basis, but it's something that we should be doing on the daily, despite what people think. We got to get over that, worrying about what people think. Who cares what people think if you're a Jesus freak? Who cares? Because when Jesus comes again, he's not going to be ashamed to claim you out of all the other freaks. Father in heaven, I just want to ask that you would please come into our lives and fill the dryness of our souls, for we're dehydrated. Father, teach us how to fill our own lives with the living water. And may we come back to the heart of worship, Lord, to get rid of the ideas that worship is just about the do's and the don'ts and the place of where we are to worship, but it's about us and the expression of you living in us and us in you to reach out to people as we see Jesus did, 
as he reminds us in Isaiah 58 that true fasting or true worship is this, to reach out to those who are oppressed, to give food to those who need it. Lord, I pray that our worship would enable us to take action like the woman at the well and to go and bring a city to your knees. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we uh, sing our closing song, The Heart of Worship. Father, we are sorry for what we may have made worship. Lord, bring us back to the heart of worship. May our lives exhibit the glory and the love of Christ. And I ask that it would be contagious, Father. And I ask that you would give us a spiritual boldness where we would not shy away from proclaiming the name of Christ within our own lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.